Floor one today is Thursday, May 9, 2024. This is the week at Charts. I'm going to thank all you guys and girls for attending. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. If you're ever looking for the show, go to DaveLearner.com slash webinar. I am now live casting, simulcasting on YouTube. I can never say that word. So you can also find me there. Obviously, we're going to talk about current market conditions, your questions on trading. Your favorite stock and picto crypto picks. If you don't mind, punch them in one at a time so I know what I covered, what I have it. Charts and charts. So lots of uh, charts I want to talk about tonight. And it's not a whole lot to cover, so we should be able to get to it fairly quick. We'll get to the live charts. Uh, that's one thing I'm kind of anxious to do. I want to talk a little bit about a bear market countdown, and that'll make sense in just one second. I think we reset on that or close to reset. We had a earnings sort of gift horse i want to talk about that um, i did apply a little scratch in one of the positions that it didn't work and i think it's important for me to show you when things don't work and then i want to talk a little bit about crypto trading and there i have one that worked one that didn't and one i'm going back after that didn't work and we'll see that in just one second anyway here's all my contact information please follow me here if you're watching on youtube that is follow me on twitter or x as they now call it i guess i need to start calling it x this is flame screen, as you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often sum it up, all predictions about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Okay, I did get a question on YouTube that I thought I should answer briefly. Now, last week, I talked about the fact that you have time to get out of the way, but not unlimited time. And one thing I thought about recently is maybe when you hit new highs start a bear market countdown a timer okay uh, like t minus 10 weeks to the bear market or whatever and obviously you don't know when that bear market is going to occur but when the market starts hitting new highs again you reset that bear market clock so it's something that kind of in the early phases of thinking about melbourne australia checking in <laughs> or melbourne as, as a, how do you say it down there melbourne Anyway, uh, so the question was, so you believe we're already hit all time high, the market is not gonna go any higher. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that you have time to get out of the market when things get ugly. Not unlimited time, but you do have time. And in some cases, it's only a few weeks, but most of the time it might take months and even longer for a market to top out. And like I said last week, borrowing some information from Greg Morris here, is that a, a bear market top or a bull market top, I should say, is more of a process than an event. It's like the, all the Johnny come lately's are kind of still buying and all the smart money, so to speak, or whatever, people who bought earlier are feeding it to them. Maybe institutions are beginning to unload. We don't know who's doing what, but that's probably a likely scenario. And all that takes time, and enough of the Johnny Come Latelys are still behind the market to kind of keep it at least flat or, or have it choppy as it goes sideways. So that's the whole point there. So, no, I don't think the market has topped. The point I was making is that we made an all time high, but that's not necessarily the all time high, okay? And we did dip into that caution zone, which I'll talk about in just one second. But fortunately, three weeks running, uh, knock on wood, if tomorrow we uh, come in, if we close uh, somewhere above uh, 4991, then we're within that 5% of all time highs. Now, one thing I was thinking about as I was putting these slides together, and it's something I talked about before, my version of technical analysis is it's it's not any mumbo jumbo. It's common sense. And if you go and look at the last several presentations, I, I talked about the fact that I am a trend following moron. I didn't invent that name for myself, <laughs> such a self-deprecating title. It was given to me and, and I was offended at first, but then I realized that, you know, when I try to outsmart the market or use some complex formulas, I tend to not do as well and, and, and actually often lose money when I do those things. But when I follow along like a good little trend following moron, not every day, not all day, not every week, not every month, okay? But over time, I tend to do okay. Just following 
my system of trend following. Now, again, if you had to call it something, it's performance-based technical analysis. It's not wave counting or Fibonacci and, and all those crazy things or any arcane. It's just, hey, how's the market doing? How's the stock doing? Is it going up? Is it going down? Is it going sideways? And should we think about getting in or getting out? And when you boil it all down, that's pretty much it. But everybody else tends to, not everybody else, but a lot of people tend to overcomplicate it. So here are the, the zones for the TFM 10% system. This red or hot pink zone, whatever you want to call it, that means you're 10% or more away from the 50-week closing high. And this red line, for what it's worth, is the 50-week moving average. Now, the TFM system was designed, the TFM 10% system was designed to get you out of the way in bear markets. That's the designer's intent, so to speak. So what you're doing is you're going to exit if you're 10% or more away from the 50-week closing high and you close below the 50-week moving average, simple moving average in this case. So your sell is down here and I'm squint my eyes, it's 46.74, I believe. So it has a ways to go, obviously. So as a general statement, and don't worry, I know, haha, -ha, but as long as you're within 5% of the 50-week closing high, and if you ever want to know what these zones are, just look at these formulas over here. So 90% would be 10% away, okay? 95% would be 5% away, and 100% would be the 50-week closing high. So the top of this green line is your 50-week closing high, okay? So along the lines of performance-based technical analysis, if you're in the green zone, let's go back one just for a second. If you're in the green zone, you're within 5%. And as a general statement, don't worry too much about the market. And I did a little back testing just by hand and kind of eyeballing it. I actually didn't write a lot of numbers down. But as a general statement, as long as you stay in the green zone, you're doing pretty good. And you probably want to stay long. And this is why. I did develop a longer term system so I could see the forest for the trees. And as ugly as it was a few weeks ago on the daily, on the weekly chart, it didn't look quite as bad. It just looked like a bit of a TKO type of move. Now, when you do get into that pink zone, which is 5% or more away from the 50 week closing high, again, you do want to think about possibly getting out of the way now right here i've plotted and again you can come over here and see 99 percent. so this is a one percent line just for s and g's i know you're gonna party with me and you can see right now once again we're within one percent of a 50 week closing high and that is obviously a good thing and you if you went back in time and i actually did this right before we went live and again you're probably thinking about wanting to party with me <laughs> It's funny, you know, it's like I get emails. I want to party with you, Dave. I'm like, all right. And then I realize, oh, yeah, it's because I make these goofy statements. Anyway, so this 1% line is, is kind of cool. And, and just in general, as long as you're within 5%, you're doing really well. And again, I was noodling with this. And this isn't a good, great example here because this would have been a losing trade. But as a general statement, I think if you got in when you were with, within 1% of the 50-week closing high, and bailed out when you close 5% or more away from that 50 week closing high. And again, let's say you'd be in, well, it might not be too bad. You've gotten in right there, okay? And then you've gotten out right here. So that probably would have been a scratch trade. You might've lost a little bit on that, but you avoided this little bit of a spill here. You've gotten back in here, okay? And then sell here. And that would have been a nice little run. So that's better than the poking eye. And then you'd be back in. So you'd say, well, this is kind of a whipsaw. But yeah, you look at the last trade. The last trade wasn't a whipsaw. So it's something I noodled with a little bit. If you wanted to take the ball and run with that, maybe use a 2% line and 5%. And it, it sounds like you're risking more than you're gaining, but it, it's not really that way because we're not taking profits at any level. This is just a mechanical system to kind of noodle with. And what you're doing is you're staying long as long as the performance of the market is good. So these are the kind of simple things I like to do. I do kind of veer off into a few more things here and there. But for the most part, I, I tend to dial it back down and keep it really, really simple. And, and what amazes me is 
when I do some more complex things, I come back to the simple stuff and it's like, you know, the simple stuff works better. And even if it doesn't drastically work better, it works about the same, you're much better off following a simple system than you are something more complex. And by the way, the other thing, I think I mentioned this last week, but one thing you want to think about when you are looking at a system is look at a segment of time, okay? Two or three years, four years, five years, whatever you want. And then, you know, maybe grab the middle of that time. So go, like, if I am if I see something in, in real time like this, like, oh, okay, this 1% this line looks interesting or 2% line, whatever, I'll go back about five years and then go forward a couple of years and see how it works. And if it looks like it works, then I'll go back to the beginning of time for the market, that is, until the uh, beginning of the markets, really. Uh, early 1920s is about the best data I can find. And then go from there and see if it worked back in time. And then, so you want to do a little bit of testing within a window. And then when you want to go forward and then go back and then obviously watch it in the future to see how it works. If you take the whole data set into consideration and you try to avoid all the bad times and catch all the good times and get in and out a whole bunch or whatever, what you will effectively have done is curve fit yourself to the market. And I was in a hedge fund project years ago, and that's what the gentleman was doing. He put me together with a hedge fund manager and he wanted us to trade his system. And he came up with a rule for everything. He had a book about that thick and he wanted me to study it. And I, I did, but eventually we parted ways because he had curve fit to the past and, and he was, um, he may have drank his own Kool-Aid. <laughs> so I don't want to get into too much details on that, get him in trouble or get me in trouble. Anyway, let's talk a little bit about the mystery charts and methodology in action. There's no mystery chart this week, but one thing I did want to show you is an earnings gift horse. And I'm always asked, do you really ignore all news? And, and the answer is yes. Now, I, I kind of grip my teeth a little bit and close my eyes when the earnings come out. But if you're to make any money longer term, you're going to have to hold through those earning periods. And knock on wood, again, we have one we got in last June or July, I forget when, and we're still there, even though the market had a few spills in between and zigs and zags, obviously. And we had um, probably three or four earning periods, at least three periods since then. And knock on wood, so far, so good again. Anyway, this was the TARS trade. Uh, this stock was just a, I watched this stock go up forever, just waiting for this thing to set up. And this was a trade that, and I can never tell my clients this because they pile into it and I get in a lot of trouble. But this was one that I really felt like it was really, really going to work. And I'd be shocked if it didn't. Now, but Dave, don't you feel like way all the time? But yeah, I always think it's a good setup. But this one, just in my bones, I felt like it was going to work. And I was shocked. When it didn't, and I, I, uh, I'm really friendly with one client. We've been friends for years, and um, I reminded him that this thing was going uh, bonkers in after hours because I knew he was busy. And he told me that he had micromanaged himself out of it, and and that's the tough part. And I told him, I said, you know, if I wasn't doing this trading service, I would have probably given up on this stock as even as great as I felt about it but my trading service is sort of my commitment device if i'm telling you what to do as a trader i am forced to do the same exact thing so without backing too far into the psychology now because we're not going to get into that too much tonight but there's always psychology underlying psychology when it comes to trading right but the bottom line is you need some sort of commitment device some commitment device is something that's going to help you stick with your goals stick with your plans for instance, before bed, I lay out all my gym clothes. And when I wake up in the morning, I put on my gym clothes, okay? And I have a morning routine to where the slot is always available for the gym. Whenever I've tried to work out over the last 10 years or however many years, I've always like, well, I'm going to go when I get a chance or when the market settles down or when I don't have a deadline. And there's always some kind of excuse. But I've reached a point where 
I'm able to go every day. I have a bit of a kind of a commitment device. And a lot of people in the gym know me now. And I'm kind of thinking like, well, if I don't go, they're going to know I didn't go. And it's just kind of a little camaraderie and stuff. But you need to do whatever it takes for your commitment devices and just say, well, here's a game plan. I'm just going to follow it, good, bad, or indifferent. But anyways, the trade is down here. And I think I did 300 shares, if memory serves, but I do try to model this the best I can. Those were the parameters. The entry was here, stop was down here, and the initial profit target was up here. Now, it took off yesterday after hours on earnings, and John in the Facebook group pointed that out. I didn't even notice it, and I'd forgotten that earnings were coming. See, I ignore all news. And I'm glad he pointed it out because it, it woke me up to like, oh, wait a minute, I better check this thing. And it was up a couple of points past the initial profit target. So I said, you know, this kind of feels like a gift horse. So I exited half of my shares in after I was trading. Now, the IPT was here around 40, 50 or whatever was just in that little spreadsheet. So I bailed out on half uh, somewhere up here. In fact, I have the actual trades. So I bailed out at 42.50. I think we were looking for 40 and change on the IPT. And you can see I got in at 320. Again, did 300 shares, just kind of rounded up in this particular case. And then you add all that up. So that's 13.95 on half. And on the first loaf, you're looking for about $1,000 profits. Now I realize as I'm going live, I did put on a few more shares, but I also got an extra point or two out of the trade or several points and that helped out a lot. Now the stop has been moved up to break even since. So we'll see what happens and we'll see how it shakes out. One thing I was thinking about as I was uh, showering right before the show is, uh, <laughs> I know the things you think about in the shower change, Dave, um, is that it seems like we haven't gotten a lot of traction yet, We lately I should say. We caught the CGC, 70-something percent in one day. Yay! But, you know, then what? You know, and I'd much rather catch a K&F and ride it out for a couple of years, all right, as opposed to have a one-and-done pop in the market like the CGC trade from last week. And I'll go over that one in just one second. But anyway, this is just a little bit more, um, I don't want to say advanced technique. But usually I don't trade in after hours. I resist the temptation. And I know I have one client slash friend and, and, and these earnings come out in after hours and he goes in and does these trades and somehow does okay. I think it's kind of a crazy way to trade, but he's he just has, um, what's the word, cojones? <laughs> it, it could do it. But as a general statement, I, I think it's a bad idea to trade in after hours trading Unless, of course, you're feeding the ducks while they're quacking. That's a Linda Rasky, what do you call a little saying like that? Saying, I guess. <laughs> so here's the aforementioned CGC. This was a, a, a stock that had bottomed out forever. It just came flying off the lows and had a nice deep pullback. Now, the HV on this one was kind of nuts a lot higher than than hv that i normally trade but if you have hv historical volatility for those who don't know and it's a good measurement and i'll show you on my other charts where i have the hv plotted but it's a good relative measurement of volatility it's kind of a standardized type of measurement because if you tell me the p's are at 14 and this stock's at 200 then I know that this stock is way more volatile, 12 times, 10 times, whatever it is, 15 times more volatile than the S&P 500. So it gives me a good point of reference. And technically, it's an annualized number. So technically, like the P's HV of 14, they should be all things constant, which nothing is in the market. There's a two-third percent chance, uh, two standard deviations, I think. I'm going to dig myself in a hole from that camera here quickly, but I think it's two standard deviations movements annualized. So if the HV is 14 over the last 50 days, historical volatility, <laughs> guy, <laughs> sound like the guy from, uh, was it my cousin Vinny <laughs> explaining things? But anyway, so 
looking back at those last 50 days, all things constant, there's a two third percent chance the stock will be 14 percent higher or 14 percent lower or whatever market you're looking at. So it, it gives you a good gauge of, of uh, relative gauge of volatility. Anyway, I'll show you that in the charts in a second. The entry was here, stop was down here, and the IPT was here. And it blasted, it did blast through the IPT, and then we raised the stop and it stopped out. Now, last week in the show, I told you that I use a little discretion. And when you're using discretion with a protective stop, I already got I already had my profit off of this, okay? So I was looking to bump my stop up to raise the stop to follow to follow along but the stop was fairly close to where the stock was trading so i let the stock kind of dip below it a little bit and you have to be careful when doing this now in this case and, I, and this is one reason i wanted to make sure i showed you is that i actually lost more money by applying a little bit of discretion longer term it'll work out if you you, you can't throw caution to the window but give it a little bit of room when you're down to that when you're kind of coming down to that stop especially if you're you happen to be watching an intraday and it's kind of bottoming out around those levels then by all means stick with it just in case it comes flying back but this is the case this is one i guess i was thinking about that it, it just seems like we need to get some traction here with some of these following through longer term and maybe that's a little bit of uh, the market so i gave it a little bit of wiggle room it obviously didn't work but I'm ready to scream next. John says, after hours made sense with TARS. Yeah, it did. I appreciate you. Uh, I, again, I appreciate you pointing that out. And I think that uh, it's just such a gift horse. And earnings are such a crapshoot. And they had blowout earnings. And they they had good earnings. And they reacted, the stock reacted well to the good earnings. Sometimes, as you probably know, it does just the opposite. So it's like, eh, this is a really good time. And, and the other thing I was thinking, too, is now if it had been bad earnings and it went up that that could be what's a good word for that uh not a hounds of the baskervilles but it would be a good thing when the market does the opposite of of what it should then i would i might not have been as inclined to take those partial profits and after i was trading so i would actually it, when you do have big movements that aren't news related sometimes those are the best ones like if you just stock just starts kind of going crazy it's like something's up but nobody seems to know what's up so somebody on the inside knows what's happening all right as i've been saying it's not about the crypto during last week's show i took a trade a live trade doing a show and i said i would follow up on that this week here's the actual trade you can see this is at six 56 so it's about almost about seven o'clock last week if i'm reading that right when i saw this setting up here i saw it making new highs i bought into it and you could see that we did hit the ipt or i did hit the hit the ipt just put a thousand dollars in you don't have to put a fortune especially in these shit coins shyt a little bit's all you need you can see it took partial profits at 20 percent and mark to market is at 532. Now you can see it dipped slightly below where I got in, but not enough for me to give up all of those open profits. So a thousand dollars in 596, a mark to market of 532. You add all that up, it's 128 dollars or 12.8 percent gain. Not bad if you annualize that. I know you can get in trouble doing that, but annualize that. That's several hundred percent at least. And we don't know. Let's just see what happens on the remainder of the position. Now, here's another one. And this is, uh, I really haven't done a lot of crypto trading. This, these are the only two crypto trades I've done, three counting the second re-entry on this in, over the last few weeks. But you can see initially I bought this one at the market at 256. Now, keep in mind in crypto, when the market is moving higher, when these altcoins or shitcoins wake up, Sometimes you could just buy the ones that are going straight up. I wouldn't do that in stocks, as I preach, unless we're in 1999 again, okay? And then sometimes in crypto, once crypto cools off a little bit, I just go back to the normal pullback stuff that I normally trade. But anyway, you can see I did get in here, and then I sold out fairly quickly here for a small loss. And I forget how big that loss was. I had it written down somewhere. Maybe I wrote it... Uh, 
80 or 90 bucks. Uh, you know, it's, it's substantial. I know, I utilize that, Dave. <laughs> but there's the initial profit target now for my new trade. Right before the show, I was looking at this, actually putting my slides together. I'm like, you know, that looks pretty good. It's breaking out to these brand new highs in here. This one's relatively new, kind of an IPO-ish type of uh, shit coin, you know? So I figured I'd give it a shot. So we'll see what happens. We'll take a look at it later in the show. Hey, if you like this video, like this video. If you don't like it, go have no fun somewhere else. <laughs> I'll get you aside. Please like them if you're watching it on video. I know everybody watching live. There's no way to like it, but uh, like it tomorrow if you get a chance. I appreciate that. It helps the algorithm. And the better I do with the algorithm, the more stuff I'm able to put out there. And subscribe, too, while you're at it. All right, let's hop into live crypto. Here's the one that I just put on. You can see the entry was right here. I'm slightly in the black. And then right here is a 20% IPT. For now, as I've been preaching, I'm just using a 20% IPT because these things can move 20% in a few minutes, okay? Down the road, maybe I need to get my historical volatility dusted off and look at some of those things, okay? Now, let's take a look at... Here's that ABT trade, just kind of hanging in there. Nothing really to get too excited about one way or the other. So these are really the only two that I've done in quite some time. This one's hit the IPT, that's why it's green. And this one is red because it has not. This is one I was watching last week. And you can see it did take off a little bit out of this pullback. So that one still looks kind of interesting as it's banging on new highs. And I'll come back to that in just one second, the new highs thing. Bitcoin has been a little disappointing. The naysayers, it's so funny. These naysayers from, <laughs> from back when it was less than a thousand, they sure are spending a lot of time saying, I told you so. Well, predict early and often. Now, admittedly, it's not looking fantastic right now. I wouldn't get too excited. I wouldn't rush out and buy it right now. That's for sure. Let's see if we can get this reset. Yeah, okay. But it's kind of hanging in there and chopping around sideways. And we have a little Landry light below the 30 EMA. By the way, as I preach, feel like tonight I'm doing a lot of preaching, <laughs> reiterating a lot of points, beating that dead horse. Um, I was told you can't say that anymore. You got to say smash the potato. But what about those poor potatoes? Anyway, beating the dead horse. <laughs> Something that... I tend to do quite a lot. I showed my wife a column once, like, hey, what do you think? I was all proud of it, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she said, you say a lot of the same shit. I'm like, ah, you know, and then the next day, somebody asked me about a stop or uh, do I really trade through earnings or something I said a thousand times. And so, well, I, gotta, I guess I have to say it a thousand times more. Anyway, back to Bitcoin, a little bit of a bounce here. I wouldn't rush out and buy just yet. As a general statement where I was going a second ago, as I say, acknowledge them is don't buy any market unless it is trading above the 30 EMA. Maybe you might have a deep pullback at something that's really clean and super volatile. Maybe something that CGC might have been, might have fit that bill. We could take a look at it in a second if you want. But as a general statement, and that's going to keep you out of a lot of trouble. And look back here, we're above the 30 EMA. Look at this run here. Wow, that's fantastic. Okay, now we're mostly below the 30 EMA stay out of this market for now. And that'll keep you out of a lot of trouble. Let's take a look at some of these ugly ones in here and see if I can prove my point. Okay, right here, okay, would you buy this? No, okay, buy it above the 30? Yes, buy it below the 30? No, okay, look, above the 30? Yes, below the 30? No. So you kind of get the idea, something as simple as that. I'm amazed at how simple you can make technical analysis. I'm not saying trading is easy by any stretch of the imagination. Let's just see what's strong in here real quick and see if there's anything worthwhile. See, I'm not a big fan of bottom fishing these that are flying off of these lows. This is probably an old trade from a long time ago. Let's see if there's anything else in there. So that's, I wouldn't rush out and buy this because it's all over the place, but it is kind of interesting that it's banging out some new highs with vigor. That one has long tails, probably a little too skinny, uh, skinny or thin for trading. 
There's the A R K M. Y'all know what these guys do? I have no idea. But I think it's college fun worthy. It's a joke when I say that, by the way. There, as that high again, you see when when the market is running, let's say if if all these all coins are going crazy, buying something like this that's begging out new highs, as crazy as it sounds, and, and again, we're not betting the farm, could really work out nicely. And we just haven't had a lot of that. I, I, a few weeks ago, I was on the boat and I was uh, trading shit coins and I was texting my aforementioned client that I'm really good friends with. And I was bragging because I had nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10 stocks that it, that I was free uh, crypto coins or whatever they're called, chick coins that were that I was free rolling in. And I thought to myself, that might be the top of that. All right, let me or that's the end of that run. Let's shift gears and take a look at the market. And then if you guys want to look at any individual stocks, let me know. You guys on YouTube, if you have any questions, please let me know. All right, let's take a look at the P's. I wanted to spend a little more time in the market tonight than normal. S&P 500, decent day there, up a half a percent. You can see these bow tie moving averages are coming together. And we're not quite, oh yeah, we are We are in uptrend proper order. Uptrend proper order is when the, and we have time tonight, let me just show you real quick. It's when the, the 10 simple is greater than the 20 simple and the 20, I'm sorry, the 10 simple is greater than 20 exponential and the 20 exponential is greater than the 30 exponential. 10 greater than 20 greater than 30. And if we take a look at the P's, so you can see it hasn't quite caught up yet. Let's let's zoom in a little bit. This bar should be green right here. We should have one. Yeah, one. Okay, now we're at one. This will turn green tomorrow, I guess. There might be a little lag in it. Green is when you have uptrend proper order, and red is when you have downtrend proper order, and yellow means they're transitioning or the moving averages are intersecting one another and you don't have uptrend nor downtrend proper order. But you can see once again, if you only stay long the market when the 10 is greater than 20, 20 is greater than 30, or this is green down here. And when they chopped around, you stayed out of the market. And when they're red, maybe short or just avoid the market if you don't short. And then, you want to be long when it's green. Now, I'm not saying go in and out, in and out, in and out on these three moving average crossovers, but what I'm saying is, as you can plainly see, it can help you to stay on the right side of the market. And that goes for any market. I haven't looked at it in Bitcoin, but just for S and Gs, let's take a look at Bitcoin. So Bitcoin, let's see. Bitcoin is in downtrend proper water, okay? So avoid Bitcoin based on that. And you can see when it's when they're, green is good and red is bad. Also, never forget to look at the chart, actually look at the chart. All right, let's get back to the, to the P's. All right, S&P 500. Here's a cool thing. Again, I know you're part of me. We're not that far from all-time highs, less than 1% away from all-time highs. I'm not going to argue with that as a trend guy, okay? We still have to get there, though, and we are a little overbought. By the way, the HV on the P's is 12, okay? I, as a general statement, like to trade stocks with an HV of at least 30 Maybe I'll dip below 30 all the way down to maybe 25 if I'm looking to short something like a big stodgy company that's just kind of rolling over from high levels. But as a general statement, I do like a little bit higher HV within reason. Now, it, now this was an extreme one at 242 now, and that's why you could have a 76% day. Of course, it cuts both ways with volatility. But if you have super high volatility and structure, so here we had structure, the moving averages went to uptrend proper order, you had a big thrust high, had a nice deep pullback, all of this stuff 
looks pretty good. You don't want to just buy a stock that looks like electrocardiogram, okay? You don't want to buy it back here when it's all over the place. But when it makes a major bottom like this, then maybe, just maybe, it's worthwhile. Is the HV6 period against the 100? Okay, so I think it's Andre. I can't read your name. Um, I hope I'm saying that right. So the six versus 100 would be a ratio. You're plotting a six period historical volatility and divided by 100. That's a good gauge. And this is uh, goes back to Connor's research. And before that, it was from Natenberg. And I think that's where he got his um, information from. I hope I didn't give it away. Uh, Natenberg wrote a book years ago called Option Pricing uh, Models or something like that. And he talked a little bit about volatility, or a lot about volatility, and that's where I learned a little about volatility too. And it's probably based on Connor's uh, references to that book. But uh, when you have that that low HV, and compared to a high longer term HV, you know that that market is kind of getting coiled up and ready to move. And that's uh, some volatility stuff that you could use. All right, let's get back to the piece. Pull this all the way down. All right, uh, let's see. Actually, let's shift gears. We talked enough about the piece. NASDAQ composite, NASDAQ composite, pretty close to all time highs, less than a percent away. So that's certainly a good thing. Both side moving averages back to uptrend proper order. And then now we have one, two, three, four, five days of Landry light above that 50. So that's a good thing. Now, I wouldn't rush out and buy the market, but it sure is looking better than it did a couple of weeks ago. It's looking better than it did a week ago, okay? And again, you know, pick your favorite performance metric. I use several of them, but the 50 simple moving average, to me, it only matters when it matters, okay? I don't really think about it too much, but when the market starts getting iffy, I'm like, where's the 50? I need to know where the 50 is, and that's a good little gauge, and maybe not as good as a 30 EMA. 30 EMA is going to be a little quicker, but the 30 EMA and the 50 are two moving averages to watch when a market gets a little iffy. You might want to write that down. Rusty, Ugh, same as it ever was. DC day to day, though, up 1%. Both side proper order to the upside, but you can see, always look at the charts, right? Still looks kind of toppy, still wide and loose, and still below a mountain of overhead supply. So I don't know if and when this thing will ever get going. I don't know what its problem is. Maybe some of you guys can opine on that, if that's the correct word. Uh, Keith, we'll get to that in one second. Uh, keep them coming, keep the stock picks coming. Let's take a look at let's take a look at some of these areas in here. Let's take a look at infrastructure. This is something I never really paid attention to, but I saw this ETF probably in the Kirk report or something, so I threw it in here. But it's banging out some new highs, so that's kind of interesting. Let's take a look at defense. Look at that, also banging out new highs. So we could see some setups on pullbacks there. If we dig down, let's take a look at this real quick. Now, we're short KBH, and we're feeling the pain. <laughs> Laugh to keep from crying. I apologize to my clients for laughing at the same thing earlier. Uh, but you can see the home builders, at least based on the M and C stock, the XHB looks a little bit different. But you can see we crawled up to this 50, and we did close above it. There's nothing magical about that, so that's interesting. But follow-through will be key. So far, that still looks toppy in here. On the short side, if you've ever shorted before, you're gonna find out that often you're right, but early, which is, what was uh, the big short? That's the same thing, Michael. <laughs> That's being wrong, in other words, but you uh, you might be a little early. Software, one of these areas not looking so hot. You can see it recently rolled over. There's your bow tie right there. The bow tie entry would have been here on the setup, and that's looking kind of ugly. Let's take a look at major drugs. Now, major drugs are back above the 50. I wouldn't rush out and buy them just yet, but that certainly is a major positive. They're now pushing into this overhead supply. Let's see how that shakes out. So that's certainly a good thing. Retail is crawling back up to its 50. It still looks toppy, okay? I think if IPOs ever get going, the Rusty will also. Ah, good point. Maybe that's what's keeping the rusty down. We need some ICO, IPO excitement. Silver the commodity taken off. We are long SVM for what it's worth. A full disclosure. Everyone look at that. 
Let's take a look at gold real quick and the gold stocks. Here's gold, the commodity, being in a rally a little bit about a pullback. And the gold stocks had a decent day today. It's kind of a choppy pullback in here, kind of all over the place. But banging out these multi-year highs on the gold stock, or right at multi-year highs, I should say. So that's certainly a good thing there, too. Now, keep in mind, gold stocks, silver stocks, they can be a little choppy. And you have to be a little bit more lenient. Like the SVM was not a perfect setup by any stretch of the imagination. And I showed this stock forever and it finally triggered today. This is college fund worthy, by the way. <laughs> I'm gonna get in trouble. So much trouble for saying that. Let's take a look at the semiconductor. Semiconductor is kind of a mixed bag. They did make it, they still look kind of toppy longer term, but they did make it back above their 50. And they're not too far away from all-time high. So I sort of want to give them the benefit of the doubt, but I still think we're at a bit of an inflection point. Now, here's the thing, and I was explaining inflection point to a few people the other day. Inflection point is like at an area where you could go either way. Right here, it looked like it was a more of a rollover. And then now that we're pushing above the 50, it looks like it can kind of go either way. Now, what good does that do you? Well, it tells you to maybe just kind of sit on your hands or be super selective if you're looking to buy a market that looks like this. I am encouraged that we made it back to the 50. We're one big up day away from looking really good in here and being close to these all-time highs. That would certainly make all the difference in the world. However, if we stall out at the 50, it could be kind of ugly. Like I was saying to my peeps in Facebook recently, I had a client that was, was a huge fan of the 50-day moving average, and he would buy pullbacks to the 50-day moving average, and, and he seemed to do okay with it. It's, it's a little bit more bigger picture than my style of trading, but I definitely think he's on to something, keeping an eye on that 50 for your longer-term analysis. Financials, doing pretty good in here. You see they sold off, pulled back a little bit, looked a little iffy, and now they're almost to all-time highs and back above that 50 and they're also above the 10 to 20 and the 30 and those guys are closing in on uptrend proper order utilities banging out some new highs with vigor utilities are acting like momentum stocks so that's kind of interesting not sure i'm going to rush out and buy some utilities but hey stranger things have happened okay any any other areas you guys want me to look at Weed's been a bit of a bummer. Just can't seem to get going. Looks like it's really taken off in here, kind of wide and loose. And then we came right back in. So Keith wants to know about CGC as a possible new setup. Uh, I'm really tempted to do like a, I hate to say a day trade, an intraday trade on this one. Because, yeah, I see what you're saying. It has pulled back. But this, this is just a one and done type of bar, that 78% bar that we had about a week and a half ago, whenever that was. And it's kind of like a pullback into a pullback, okay? So you've got, let me just show you this real quick. You've got a pullback and then you have another pullback, but this pullback is into this pullback. So just not a big fan of that type of pattern. I would much prefer this to be more than a one day run and clear these highs decisively and then pull back. But yeah, it does have a bouncy feel to it, like it might be worth an intraday trade. And and this thing is such a beast. You have to be super careful if you decide to go after something like that. Okay, feels like I'm leaving something out. Any other questions? Okay, we answered the one on HV. Any other stocks you guys want to look at real quick? Uh, face, uh, YouTube people, I know you're a few seconds behind, about a 30 seconds behind, but when you hear this, quickly punch in any symbols you want, and I'll be happy to take a look at them. Okay. We'll go on once, go on twice. I'm sure I thank all you guys and girls for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. Anything unanswered? David, Dave, Landry.com. Everybody have a great night. All you people on Facebook, I'll see you tomorrow. Everybody else, have a great weekend. Hope to see you again next week, and may the trend be with you. Thank you so much.